How many injustices were done at the last day of Jesus' life on earth? That's what we're going to talk about in Matthew 27. We're two chapters from the end of Matthew, and it is grim. We call it Good Friday. And as a non-Christian, Good Friday, why is it so good? It's good because we know in the end this is the fulfillment of God's salvation plan, his rescue plan for humanity. And while we don't like to see any of this happen, we have to realize that if God picked the Norwegian people to be the chosen people, these would be Vikings. You know, if this was any group of people, if we picked the Midwest people to be the children of God, these would be a bunch of Midwest people calling for the death of Jesus. It just so happens that the Jewish people were the chosen people, and so they happen to be the people who are going to bring these injustices to God. This is not about Jewish. This is not about not Jewish. This is about that any one of us, if we were called to be the people of God, would have struck him down, would have brought him to this combination of the religious authorities and then eventually the state authorities to be done with him. It's because we are sinful people, not any group of people, but all of us. And so we have to remember that all the things that happen here is something that any one of us would have done. So in the morning of this chapter, it says it took counsel against Jesus, meaning they're accusing him and they want him put to death. Remember, in all of this fake trial that we had this last time, they were calling up witnesses. They were trying to derive people to testify against Jesus. This wasn't a real court system. And the only thing that they brought against him was this blasphemy, that he was going to tear down the temple, he was going to bring it back up. This was not something the Romans cared about at all. The Romans were about keeping order, civic order. They had rules. And it's not like they're very civilized. They will kill people for any and all reasons. They killed a lot of people. They had no qualms about murder. This is not what it is. But the things that they charged Jesus with, that's not a concern to Rome at all. They didn't care. And so they're going to bring him now to Pilate the governor. And that's going to be in where Herod used to hang out. Again, I usually hung out in Caesarea. He was off into the coast. So this probably is the thing that brought him to come here. He doesn't want things getting out of control. He wants to hang out in Caesarea. But now he's getting forced to be here in Jerusalem to put this down. And you can imagine as Romans, you know, they were warmongering. They were interested in conquest and get involved in all these little petty local things probably made their eyes roll, but they knew they had to do it in order to keep the peace. And governors were assigned in places of weakness where they would rather have the, the Herod situation, where there's a Herod out there making sure that everything stays in tow. Everything is kept the correct way. They, that's what they want to have happen. And then Herod's children were such disasters in leadership, they had to appoint a governor. And that's going to be Pontius Pilate. He was there from 26 to 36 AD. This is not a great job. First of all, if you're sent out into the hinterlands, it's important that the hinterlands are kept in tow, but it also means that he probably wasn't a very important guy. This was his chance to look impressive to the rest of Rome. And when you're sent out into areas that are less desirable, either because of climate, because of wealth, you know, they didn't want to be there. But again, if they did a good job here, they would get to go and do good jobs other places. Not only that, the Romans, like I said, had no qualms with killing or replacing anybody. This happened all the time. So if Pilate made it this long, it means that he fulfilled the Roman decrees pretty well. He was able to put down rebellions. He was able to command legions. He was able to do the things that Rome entrusted him to do. So while this was a pretty bad assignment, it means he's not a nice guy. None of these people were nice people. So we have to keep in mind, Pontius Pilate is an interesting character, to say the least. So the next part of it talks about Judas who was the betrayer, I think, you know, must have realized what he did. 
like I said, I don't know if he didn't think that Jesus would allow himself to be taken. Maybe he thought this would spur Jesus on to call down his legions of angels and take out the Romans. I'm not, we don't know. But when he probably saw this group of sordid and clubbed people taking Jesus away when they seized him, he knew what happened. He knew what he thought was going to happen. Or maybe he imagined this is what's going to happen. But when he actually saw it, he knew, you know. And so he brought back the 30 pieces and he said that he betrayed innocent blood. So he knew what he did. And they said, you know, why do we care? This is, seems like a you problem. And so they threw the pieces of silver onto the ground and he went and hanged himself. So he took the very life that God gave him. And the chief priests were all like, well, what are you going to do with all this money? And well, he said, since it's blood money, we really can't do much with it. So they bought a field so that you could bury strangers in it. You know, we'll just do something with it so that we don't have to have it in our coffers because we're not supposed to do that. This fulfilled a prophecy of Jeremiah. Again, Matthew loves to tell us when prophecies have been fulfilled. And so that's when they call potter's field. At one time, there was probably a potter there, but now it's just a field. So it's interesting. I, we heard this uh, chapter in my church a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's interesting that they paid this blood money. And now when they get it back, they go, oh, we're not going to take it. It's blood money. I think it goes along with everything Jesus has been saying the whole time. You come up with skirtings around the law. It wasn't blood money before. It wasn't blood money while you were trying to get someone to betray him, but suddenly now it's blood money. And the blood is on their hands too. It's not just Judas, it's their hands as well. Shows you, I think, proof of everything that Jesus has been saying coming to fruition right here. And so the Sanhedrin itself wasn't allowed to have trials at night. They were supposed to also have formal charges, which again, they were trying to get anyone to speak up at any time they could. But then it says that they brought Jesus to Pilate. The Roman workday started, it said, at daybreak. And Pilate was already there, ready for his job for the day. The Sanhedrin judges had some freedom to make things happen inside of Jerusalem and inside of Israel. But by them bringing Jesus to Pilate, they're saying, we don't have the official power to do the thing we want to do. They want Jesus put to death. And I think Pontius Pilate is going to be really perplexed about this whole thing because he's going to think, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> Why? You don't even have many charges on him. You say he's blaspheming against God. That's none of my business. And I don't care. I don't care. And he's probably sitting there thinking about any of this. Why are you doing this to me? So now Jesus is standing before Pilate and he says, you know, hey, are you the king of the Jews? You said so. <laughs> he's not denying it, you know. And so when he all the accusations from the priests and the elders come out. Pilate turns to him and says, do you not hear all the things they're saying about you? Are you going to answer any of these charges? And I'm sure Pilate, like I said, had been in this situation a hundred times where someone was brought before him and Jesus gave him no answer. And it said that the governor was greatly amazed. This is ESV. Why was he amazed? Because he probably saw people groveling. He probably saw people afraid. He saw people saying, I never did any of that, you know, trying to get out of whatever it is they were being accused of. And here Jesus is like, not saying a word, probably appreciated it in some way. The Roman love, that sort of stoic, quiet, you know, I'm not groveling. I'm not bowing down and begging and pleading and crying. He probably has admired that kind of response. and. What's interesting about the situation is Pilate had all the oomph in the world to put Jesus to death. He probably didn't care again. He had no agenda in this. He had no wish in it. He doesn't believe in the Jewish religion at all. He doesn't care if Jesus says he's the Messiah. It, it's a kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with him. And so then he's just probably like, what got you people all riled up about this? Why this guy? He's not dressed like a king. He's not in a robe. He's not demanding the removal of the Roman Empire. He's not removing Caiaphas. I mean, he's not asking for anything. He's just some dude in a countryside robe. 
Why does this matter? And so we'll see in other places, and we'll get to this in Luke, not spoiler alert, but Pilate's wife has something to say about this. Okay, so that makes the whole story interesting. But in this particular passage, we see that Jesus is dignified. He's quiet. He's not getting into a fight with the Sanhedrin. He's also not really trying to get out of this. Again, he is doing this to fulfill the prophecy. And so it has to happen. So at this particular feast time, usually what the Roman government did is they released someone, one of the prisoners. And so Pontius Pilate is probably like, okay, so here's my way out. You know, I don't really have anything against this guy. I don't think he really did anything. So he goes to the people and says, okay, you know, I usually let one person go. Who do you want me to let go? This very innocent looking man who doesn't say anything or this horrible, horrible criminal that's just, you know, done a million crimes and an insurrectionist. And everyone's like, yeah, let Barabbas go. Really? Really? Someone said before you get all mad about Barabbas being let go, it's bigger than that because we're let go. Regardless of what we did, regardless of how we treated people, regardless of what sins against God we committed, Jesus takes on this and we're let go. It's the same message in both places. So we can't get indignant about it because we have also been given that same option. We've been let go in the place of Jesus. And it says that he knew that these accusations were because of envy. The chief priests, the rabbis, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were envious. They were mad because Jesus is telling them these things, knows all these things. I mean, again, he's some hick from the hinterlands and he's telling us how to study the Bible and calling us out. So their envy of his knowledge of everything He knew this doesn't have anything to do with him. So it said that the chief priests and the elders were persuading everyone. We want to destroy Jesus because that's what they want this to be over with. They want Jesus to just be done before they lose respect from the people, before anything else happens. And, you know, again, because they don't want rioting. You know, they don't want the Roman Empire to come down crashing on them. So everyone, just like the chief priests, asked them, said Barabbas. And he's like, okay, well, what should I do with Jesus? And they're all like, crucify him. Again, if the Norwegians were the chosen people or people from the Midwest of America were the chosen people, we would all do the same thing. Makes me wonder, you know, it says that the chief priests and everyone set everyone against Jesus. But I also, you know, mobs are bad news. I live in a place that gets a lot of protests. And every time you'll see one group of people out protesting other groups of people, and you just say, oh, it's a tinderbox out there. I hope nobody gets hurt. So anyway, whenever you get sort of that mob riled up, very typically, they make the wrong decision. So when Pilate said that nothing was happening, he was really hoping, I think, to let Jesus go. And then rather having a riot and go against the people, he goes and washes his hands. And he says, I'm, I'm done. I'm innocent of all of this. You did this yourself. And then the people answered, yeah, we did this. We'll have the blood on us. Don't worry about it. And again, it could have been Midwesterners. It is the blood on all of us for killing Jesus. We are the killers of Jesus. And so they delivered him and scourged, which means whipped with, I don't want to get too gross, but it meant a gory whipping. And so he was scourged for it. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters. The whole battalion was before him. So every, all of them were there. They stripped him. They put on a scarlet robe. Maybe it was, you know, obviously not a king's robe. And kneeling before him, they were mocking him. Hail, king of the Jews, you know, and then they're spitting on him. And basically beating him with a reed, which would hurt a lot, and mocked him. The convent I stayed at, again, because it was the only women's bathroom in the entire old city of Jerusalem that I could find, there's a convent there. And this was the place that happened. It's on what is called the Via Dolorosa, which is the way of the cross. It means that this was a place that Jesus was on his way to his death. And so you could go down there and see it. And I just, 
again, I'm an atheist. And I'm like, gosh, this is where they took Jesus and did these things to him. Because, you know, obviously the plaques were there to tell you what happened here. Horrible, you know, I mean, just awful. And so then they uh, stripped him and led him away to be crucified. So then they went out and when you are to be crucified, someone also brought up about the mocking of Jesus and the crown of thorns and this robe and, you know, how they were making fun of him. It's, this was, again, not the best location to be get sent to duty as part of the Roman Empire. You know, this is Jerusalem thought a lot of itself and it thought of Galilee as the backwoods, but the Roman Empire thought of this entire place as the backwoods. And so their cruel fun was doing something like this. You know, they didn't have to do this. Pilate probably never asked them to do it, but this is sort of what people did to make their days less mundane. Cruelty from a cruel nation. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's, it's just sad, like I said. That cross weighed anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds, part you had to carry. The total cross weight was about 300 pounds, but it was probably tied to his hands. And so he's already been beaten. He's already been in prison. He probably hasn't eaten since then. And he's not in the best of shape. So this man, Simon, which is from Cyrene, Cyrene was a city in North Africa. And it said it had a substantial Jewish population. Now, we talked about in my Small Steps with God podcast about different places that Jews were exiled to as part of the Assyrian and Babylonian exiles. And North Africa was one of those places. So it had a Jewish community that was there. And so this guy was probably just a bystander. He had nothing to do with this story. And yet he's standing there in the crowd. And they say, hey, you know, you start carrying the cross. You, you help. And so he helped bring the cross. They carried it to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And when you go to Israel, there's two places they think this happened in. One place does look like a skull, and that's kind of interesting. So I think that that was the place that most Catholics believe was the place. Because what happened is Helena, who was the mother of the very first Roman emperor, who became a Christian, that's under dispute if he was really a Christian, but she was a Christian and she comes to Jerusalem and she starts looking for locations and artifacts. And she deemed this place of the skull, which now they call Golgotha, as the place where Jesus was crucified. There's other places, and this is the Protestant place, that say, people say, no, 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 it was more likely over here. Because the point of crucifixion was to embarrass the person who did it, was to be a warning sign to everybody else. Hey, you screw around. You're going to end up just like this guy. And Golgotha was, if I recall, a little bit away from the, the route. And so they feel this other place was more likely the place because it was where a lot of people were crucified. And at the time, it's, it's kind of funny because at the time I was in Israel, a lot has changed. You know, now when I read about stories and there's DNA and we have better methods of testing things, people weren't crucified. This is made up. We don't have any evidence of crucifixion in the Roman Empire at all. And then you found out, oh, yeah, it happened a lot. And then they found a nail through someone's foot who was a crucified human being. So this is something that happened and it happened in public. So Jesus is brought out to this place. His again, they divided his garments. I mean, it couldn't have been, this had to be blood soaked, sweat soaked clothing. It doesn't even make sense. And cast lots for them. And then they all sat down and watched over, you know, they're ready for Jesus to die, along with the two other robbers. And at the top of his cross, it said, Jesus, King of the Jews. And that's where you'll see on certain Christian elements, it'll say, I N R I which is standing the abbreviation for Jesus, King of the Jews. So they were mocking him as being King of the Jews. See, this is what happens to the King of the Jews. Watch out. Two other robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. So they put him between two bad people. And then they were deriding him. These robbers who are also on the cross. 
And, you know, so they, it says they were wagging their heads. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, if you're the son of God, come on down, take yourself off this thing. And so the chief priests and the scribes and the elders are also mocking him too and saying, oh, look at him. He says he can save other people. Look at all the things he supposedly did. He can't even save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down. You know, so everyone's being cruel at this point, even the robbers next to him. He says he's the son of God, but now, you know, these robbers are going to die his same way. So there, and everyone else who were standing out there waiting, he doesn't he save himself? We have seen him do miracles. We have seen him cast out demons out of people in caves who were scaring everybody. He did so, he walked on water. And he, he's not coming down off of this. Why not? So this was about the sixth hour after sunrise. But now we hear more of the story that talks about how they offered him a wine drink mixed with gall. And gall would have been a bitter herb. Some people feel that this wine was offered to people because it, it would have had something in it that would have blunted the pain probably like some form of opiate or something like that, that would have reduced it. And he tasted it, and then it says he wouldn't drink it. He wasn't going to take the edge off of this at all. Okay, so now, you know, he's, cruci he's crucified, and everyone is standing around. I'm sure there were tears for everyone. You know, maybe even the robbers had people. But, you know, people were all sitting there. This part where it says there was a darkness there over the land until the ninth hour after sunrise. And Jesus cried out in a, large, a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And everyone could hear this. And the word he used was L-I-L-I, -L -I, you know, so El all El Shaddai. Every time you hear El, think God. And I, at the end of any Hebrew word, meant my, me. It's a reflexive term. And so you can see the I at the end of the word forsaken. Why have you forsaken at me, you know, so you can see that in play. And people heard it and they must have misunderstood what he was saying. Oh, he's calling out to Elijah because they heard Eli, Eli instead of Elijah. So he's asking for the Messiah or a prophet to come save him. And again, they put the sponge with the sour wine on it and tried to give it to him to drink. And then they're all like, well, let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. I mean, he says he's a prophet of God. Let's see what happens next. And then Jesus cried out in a loud spirit and yielded, it says, his spirit. You know, he gave it up. He was not killed. He yielded it. He let it end. And they said at that moment, temple curtain was torn in two. This was to keep the Holy of Holies isolated from everyone else. And some people, when I was first becoming Christian, mentioned that that probably means there's no more barrier between us and God. We had this temple structure where our rabbis would go in and offer sacrifices, offer thanksgiving to God for us in the holy of holy areas. With that temple curtain torn, there's no more barrier between us. We now have direct access to God. It says the earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs were open, and it says the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep that were dead were raised and coming out of tombs after his resurrection. They went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many. The centurions who were there and keeping watch over that felt the earthquake. They saw what was taking place and they said with awe, and again, these are the centurions, these are the Romans, this is truly the Son of God. This is the Messiah they were saying about. The many women who were there were at a distance. Hey, who would want to be that close? but they were probably also afraid of being arrested themselves, said that they followed Jesus, they were ministering to him, and that was Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James and Joseph, and the mothers of son of Zebedee. Remember, we talked about her a couple of episodes ago. She was saying, hey, can my son sit on your left and right? And he said, they will certainly drink the cup that I'm going to drink too. I wonder if that was running around in her mind at that point says that Jesus then, at the way that they were giving the timing, meaning that he died at 3 p.m. So the sun would have been up, but we had the darkness. And that curtain ripping into people would have been there. There would have been earthquakes. People would have been awake and seeing all of this. 
at one time behind that curtain was the Ark of the Covenant, which is where the Ten Commandments were. We have to hurry and bury him because, again, we were on Thursday. Now we're on Friday. Sabbath comes at sunset. So he has to be buried before sunset or he's going to be left out there on the cross for many days. And so it says Joseph of Arimathea came and it's a town that was somewhere about 20 miles east of what is Jaffa. Jaffa is a coastal city. And so this was about 20 miles east of there or more towards Jerusalem. And it was an area of Samaria. So it was part of the Sumerian empire. But Joseph was rich and he had land and he had a family plot. He asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate gave it to him. What is my pilot? I'm sure like, I don't care. And so then he takes it. He does the proper Jewish burial, wrapping it in clean linens and laid it in his own tomb. And it said that he had the rock, which means it's, it's going to be like a cave. And then maybe even on the cave, there's going to be a shelf on the cave where the body goes. And so he brought it in there. And then you roll a stone in front of the door so that it seals it up. It closes it up. And then Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there on the opposite of the tomb. It says the next day, you know, because like I said, we have to get going. This is Sabbath. And so it said the next day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate again. And I'm sure again, Pilate's like, I don't care. And he says that you remember that pastor said he's going to be raised after three days. See, so they understood the analogy. He wasn't talking about the temple being destroyed, him rebuilding it in three days. They understood what he meant, that he was going to die and he was going to come back in three days. That was a sign of Jonah. So they go to Pilate the day before and say, see, he says he's going to cause destruction. And now you hear, they know what he meant. So he goes to him and says, you know, this guy said he's going to raise from the dead. If his body disappears, it says that last fraud will be worse than all the other ones, the first one. And so Pilate says, fine, you have guards of soldiers, go secure it, make sure that it's not stolen. So it said they sealed the stone and set guards or set a guard. And I think there were more guards. And so they wanted to make sure that no one stole the body because if they steal the body, then everyone goes, see, he did resurrect. See what happened? But like I said, when I was in Jerusalem, I asked about messiahs and prophets. And they said, oh, there was about 80 at the time. They said, Jerusalem is a prophet and a messiah making place. A lot of people, even to this day, will go as tourists or on pilgrimages to Jerusalem and end up thinking they're the Messiah or they're a prophet. And there's like, a, I guess, a whole area of the psychiatric wing there for people who get this feeling. And so there were 80 people who were all declaring themselves to be one or the other, and they all died. And that was the end of it. If this guy comes back after him predicting that he's coming back in three days, we're toast. This is going to be worse than anything that's already happened. So that's why they're so worried about it and they set out ahead of time in order to prevent it. So my meditation today is just about this awful end for Jesus, but it's more that any one of us would have done it. If any one of us would have been part of the chosen people, we would have done the same and the same outcome would have happened. And the outcome could have not been prevented because we would lose our method of salvation. So I want to think about the fact that we are so lost as human beings that we would do this to anybody, but any one of us would have. My prayer is for forgiveness because the blood of Jesus is on every one of our hands and we are a part of it. But not only are we a part of the blood of Jesus on our hands, but that blood is the redeeming blood and it happened to save us. Boy, that's a lot. And what I want to share with other people is that fact that people are redeemed through the blood of Jesus, despite the fact that we are the people yelling, crucify him, despite the fact that we are the Barabbases who committed crimes and yet were set free when Jesus was not set free. That's what I really want to share with people so they understand the price was paid by Jesus to save us all. Hi everyone, thanks so much. I know we're getting very um, 
solemn. We are also coming in times of Easter at the particular airing of this podcast. It's coming up in a few weeks and I appreciate your prayers. Please let me know if I can pray for you. And if you have anything to say, please email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much.